are now listening to The Big Trade with Peter Pham, enlightening conversations for maximum market returns. Victor, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, yes, my name is Victor Ricardi. I currently teach a professor, finance professor at Goucher College in Baltimore, Maryland, where I teach uh, courses in uh, basic finance and uh, behavioral finance and psychology of money and investments. I also have a new book out on called Investor Behavior, the Psychology of Financial Planning and Investing with my co-editor, Ken Baker of American University. And within that book, we, we recruited about 45 experts in the field, and they were 30 wonderful chapters on all types related issues to behavioral finance in terms of how they affect the investment decision-making process. Wow, that's fantastic. So, Victor, as an individual covering behavioral finance, what approach do you think investors should take to observing markets and the behavior of uh, the participants within the market? Well, I think I was people should try to think of themselves in two realms: how they react as an individual, what things that uh, what mistakes they've made in the past. So maybe um, many times uh, a tenant of behavioral finance is people tend to be overconfident and they tend to trade too much, uh, for example, and that will wind up resulting in lower returns during during the year uh, versus people also impacted by the market psychology. We have so much available data, people watching news reports in which uh, the reaction on TV can actually impact the emotional aspects of our brains and how we make decisions. So I think uh, even myself, if I'm finding that I'm being impacted with too much negative news on a given day, and that may impact my uh, willingness to, say, invest in the stock, uh, it's something a very simple therapy for me is just to shut the TV off. Hmm. That's interesting. Are you implying that with too much information, it, it can actually be hazardous to your investing and trading decisions? And then I guess the question would be, what information then would be significant? And for me, I take a much more quantitative approach to investing and trading. So I don't know what your thoughts are on all this. Um, I would say, for example, there. Are, uh, you know, the I think many times we're conscious of our decision, but I don't think what people think about is our subconscious. So, for example, there's all types of research now that really look at our subconscious. So we, we may not even realize it, but if there's a study, for example, that shows it takes two groups of individuals and one shows a person a negative story or a negative uh, discussion, and then they go to bid on something like a cup or a, a stock versus someone else who did not have the same story. And the person subconsciously beforehand who, in, who was exposed to this negative story wound up bidding, say, four times as much as the individual who didn't see the negative story. So that even just shows how com- complex our decision-making process is. But also the idea is to try to look for a disciplined strategy. What key factors do we really believe in, whether we're value investors, whether we're growth investors, and try to come up with a, you know, four or five things that we think are very important uh, to assess a stock or some type of investment, and to really try to stick with those and to have a philosophy and not be overtaken by our emotions. Anecdotally, I notice that typically news tends to focus, at least general news tends to focus on very negative events. Has this ever been, like, has a study ever been conducted to observe this? Because most media headlines are actually negative, and if that's the case, then does that affect how the investor or trader approaches the market? Yes, and again, there's um, two main uh, perspectives on this. I would say. Depending on uh, if it's negative news, for example, sometimes negative news, for example, will have a negative impact on our tolerance for risk, leading to possibly us not having a willingness to invest in a stock or take risk investing in the stock market. There's another line of reasoning that gives the opposite. When you're in a bad mood, you take more risk because you're acting out your um, 
the reaction to that news, and then you'll take risk into buying stocks. So I think understanding what type of personality type you are very, is very important also. So, for example, on the personality type, especially what we talk in the book, the two most dominant aspects of how people make decisions in terms of their personality is people who are extroverts tend to take on additional risk, and then people who are um, narcissistic also tend to be greater risk takers. Hmm, that's very interesting. There's a general premise in the markets that you got to buy low and, and sell high. And in periods when you're buying low, hopefully you're taking big positions to do so. At what stage does an investor or individual just look at themselves in the mirror and say, is this uh, the right decision that I'm making objectively? Or is this a decision that's reflecting some kind of psychological reflection of myself? Well, I would say that it's very hard to know when we're buying low. So the idea many times, I guess I'm less of a trader and I'm more focused on being an investor when I'm talking about behavioral finance. Mm -hmm. I think it's the idea of using that, uh, trying to assess your risk tolerance and proper risk perception indicators, combine that with an asset allocation strategy, and essentially to me the key to writing out whether you're in a good market versus a bad market is to actually use rebalancing in your portfolio. Because again, when the market is going up, up, going up in a bull market and you're making money, people don't worry about risk, so they keep on putting their money in riskier assets, but on a yearly basis or on a quarterly basis, they should take some of the money off the table and put that money into safer assets. And in times when we're really depressed or in a, in a bear market where people don't have uh, the aversion to invest in stocks is when they should take money from safer assets and try to buy low. And that's where, kind of where I think the rebalancing is a wonderful thing of overcoming two major groups in behavioral finance, which are the overconfident ones I mentioned. But the other group is people who suffer from inertia or status quo bias because they don't bother their investments. So there tend to be people who trade too much and are overconfident. The other group tends to be procrastinators. When I was working at the sell side, people would always talk about using conviction, for example. And if you had an idea, you needed to demonstrate conviction. I guess for a great investor, you have to start to identify, is this conviction or is this a stage of being a little dogmatic in terms of your idea? And the better you are at assessing this, according to what you're saying, probably the better investor you're going to make. Yes, exactly. And also, again, it's also what the name of your investment philosophy are you're implementing. Uh, for example, it's, we're pre-programmed to be growth investors many times because we take an optimistic view uh, or we have an optimism bias expecting only looking at to make money from investments that, that are experiencing very high growth. Um, I think what you're alluding to is also the other way that we can make money is being a contrarian or using something like value investing. And right. again, within that framework, value investing versus growth investing, investors or even traders, I mean, especially the more experienced people are going to realize that stocks run through those growth and value cycles. So having both in your portfolio, but also leaving in that conviction of that idea and going against the crowd is a wonderful way to actually make money in the market. As well. Yeah. So, what trends have you observed recently in the markets based on your form of analysis, and how might those trends fit into behavioral finance in general? Um, well, I would say the big, biggest thing that I see, uh, and again, I'm, I'm more of an academic, but I think one thing that's very important is that just the market runs through cycles. And again, still we have a investor sentiment, at least in the United States, in which stocks still are keep on going up. We have lower inflation, and with, low, with falling oil prices, you know, we're talking about maybe, you know, going to 18000 in a Dow. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we even go higher in 2000. 16 and 2015, in which now you have a uh, Democratic president with a Republican uh, Senate and House, where markets kind of like the idea of no gov- more new government regulation. So you can see a uh, furthering or extension of the current bull market, I think. So do you think there's ways that people within the audience that are listening can? distinguish themselves different from the pack and the herd? Or or 
is behavioral finance a form of study that also encourages the observation of the herd? I think it's the observation of the herd partially, but also I think it's using certain, there are, I would say now, the a couple of the major training strategies in behavioral finance would be, depending on your belief in more efficient markets, I think earning surprises are very important. Right. So if you're going with the assumption of overreaction, underreaction, following uh, stocks or following industries is a major way in which even you see many of these uh, so-called behavioral finance mutual funds are making money. And again, I think the contrarian and the value investing approach really is behavior in itself. So that's another approach. There's also hedge fund reports uh, that, is, uh, that disclosures. I think it's called the 13F report. We talk about in the book, and it, it, it looks at what hedge funds are buying every quarter. And there's a number of couple studies that show if you actually look at those reports and you buy stocks of hedge funds or what they're disclosing in reports, you can actually make above average returns as well. Right. I've heard from other studies as well. I've heard Jim Cramer indicate previously that he's also conducted or his t- research team conducted that very same study in which you're following, you know, effectively insider buying and identifying opportunities. And very few of them had actually generated significant alpha. So I, I'm getting a sense that there's conflicting research towards an approach like that. Yeah, and that's, why, and that's why, again, if you're looking at different time periods, if you're looking at, and again, it's also, I think, how you're defining uh, Bob Alpha. Many t- I think, you know, looking at the couple of studies I've seen, many times those opportunities are essentially disappearing within a year. So you're talking about the ability to take maybe a 10, 12% return from these strategies in some cases, but also making sure you actually then have a plan for selling out of that that type of strategy because they're only going to tip with, maybe they only run and invest your momentum in those particular situations only runs maybe 6 to 12 months. So if you're using like a buy and hold strategy, the return does fall back to the reverse to me at some point. Okay, very interesting. So what is the role of risk tolerance and risk perception on investment decision making? I would say they're interconnected. Risk tolerance is a set trying to assess what level or the maximum amount of risky assets such as stocks you'll accept in your portfolio. So there's all types of, in the book, uh, my co-author and I wrote a chapter in which we look at okay, so many different risk tolerance questionnaires, and we really determined there aren't that many risk tolerance, tolerance questionnaires that are good at assessing risk. What would improve many of these risk tolerance questionnaires would be taking something like risk perception, which is looking at the cognitive process and the emotional process in how people are affected by many of the behavioral finance issues. So I think actually making a risk tolerance questionnaire that takes many of the major themes or tries to assess many of the major themes in behavioral finance would make a much better instrument in how you actually assess people's risk. So, for example, from the financial crisis, people's risk tolerance may currently be the same if they took a risk tolerance questionnaire. I, but what I see now for a group of many, many Americans from the financial crisis is they have their risk tolerance may be the same, but their fear of putting money in stocks because they were burnt or they they were traumatized by the financial crisis. Um, their risk perceptions are very high. So over the long term, I worried about a lost generation in which their risk perceptions or fear of putting money in stocks ultimately may change their risk tolerance over time. Right. So, so what you're almost implying potentially is that for a whole new generation in, of investors that probably one of the biggest risks that they're taking is by not participating in this bull market. Exactly, because there's another chapter in the book that talks about the trauma of post-crisis events. So especially um, millennials or people in their 20s or early 30s have experienced multiple shocks. If you look at the, the bear market of the early 2000s, if you look at the Internet bubble, so 
there are, and now even the financial crisis, if you go through three, two or three major economic shocks in a short period or a couple of uh, decades, that could have lasting effects on a generation of putting money into the stock market. So in terms of the new generation, which is probably a lot of the students that you're teaching as well, what do you think is the best approach for them to take towards investing and trading and implementing some of these behavioral finance uh, studies that you've already conducted? I would say, again, that there, there's really two schools of thought of finance, and one is the standard approach. Uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket, and everybody's rational. I actually agree with many of the tools that they imply. I think the, the biggest difference is understanding is is the underlying assumptions. So as human beings, uh, we tend to be overconfident, we say too much. We also tend to be loss of person, which we don't want to take the losses. So losses tend to feel twice as painful as an equivalent gain. So if you understand these particular issues and you design a discipline strategy, again, based on your risk tolerance, an asset allocation strategy, but also the idea is to try to get people to start utilizing time to buy money. And I tell my students in particular, get started early and continually invest until your retirement age and you'll be a millionaire. But also, the most difficult thing is to overcome the procrastination of investing on a yearly basis. But also probably the most difficult thing is how you get that eye in time value of money, where, or how you get that 8 to 10% on a yearly basis. And I think the key to that is, again, using a financial advisor, but also tying in with the aspect of rebalancing. Right. Victor, I find this to be very interesting in, from the perspective that clearly behavior, because the markets and arguably some people would say that economy is effectively an organism, a living organism to some extent that's affected by so many different contributions from so many different individual players that it would be ideal for investors to try to find a few tools that help them gauge behavior to some extent. You know, people would refer to things like the volatility index, the VIX as a fear gauge to some extent. I'm a big fan, as I indicated to you earlier, about market auction theory, which is to measure the supply and demand through bids and ask. Uh, lifting of offers, basically, and hitting of bids as forms to understand the magnitude of participation and involvement that both retail and institutional investors have in the market. And then measure, say, for example, volatility within option premiums to go in conjunction with earning surprises to some extent. So I think that for behavioral finance, if one tries to find all these quantitative indicators to use, it makes their decision-making process that much more effective. And the unfortunate thing is that many of the students, especially millennials and the new generation, they understand things like big data, they understand applications, information technology. And one of the things that I've always been stressing is how all of that can be merged to understanding markets so they can capitalize on that. Oh, yeah, and I definitely agree with you. It's trying to get them to, I think, you want to present them with enough of the different theories. And I kind of teach my students, especially in the behavioral finance side I utilize, I take that, I teach them both types of strategies, but then on an individual level, the behavioral finance class I utilize, I have them take about 25 personality questionnaires on all types of different topics in behavioral finance during the semester. And they then are able to discover who they are as an individual, again, and then, again, understanding their positive perspectives, but then understanding when they make bad decisions, and then try to then help them come up with maybe five, uh, as you said, indicators or five investment strategies that they're going to believe in to help them make some money over their, time, over their lifetime, but also invest that money wisely. Yeah. So for anyone that 
has difficulty in、uh, seeing the effectiveness of this approach, I highly recommend anyone to watch something like the World Series of Poker, for example. You'll constantly see the same kind of players within, like the finals, for example, and they're making those kind of decisions based on their understanding of probabilities and their understanding of risk as well. So that's a very interesting watch. And thank you very much, Victor, for your contributions today to the audience. And I hope that everyone gets a chance to read your book when they get. The chance. Okay,、uh, great. I really appreciate it. And again, the, the investor behavior is available on you know on Amazon throughout the world. And again,、uh, for people, I always recommend if you don't want to buy an actual copy, if you're a member of a, a university, a college, or even、um, just、uh, your local library, just have them purchase the book. Again, I don't make. I'm not worried necessarily worried about making. A lot of money from royalties. I'm more interested in educating the general public. My co-editor Ken Baker. We, you know, we want to know that people are actually reading the book and getting educated. And ultimately, I have no conflict of interest. I just want people to be able to have a higher standard of living because of this project. Thank you very much, Victor. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this mastermind session. If you'd like to contact Peter Pham or Phoenix Capital, please email info at phx-cap.com. 